right. All right. Good evening, everyone. This is Rob Orson with the Emerging Revolutionary War. I apologize. We had some technical difficulties there. Uh, Mark and I are historians, not techies, so we did the best we could, so we're a little late. So I apologize. But thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight should be a fun conversation. I have one of my uh, esteemed colleagues in the Virginia Museum field, Scott Harris, with us here tonight. Uh, Scott is the executive director of the University of Mary Washington Museums, which includes a very interesting museum about James Monroe that we'll talk about here in a little bit. But Scott also knows a lot about um, one of our former presidents and a, a, a character of the Trenton and Princeton story. And that's why Mark is with us. He's the author of Victory or Death. He's also our lead tour guide for our upcoming bus tour, which is November 12th through the 14th. And we'll be covering, Mark and I will be covering the battles of Trenton and Princeton. Um, good news is we still have seats left. The bad news is, is we only have 10 seats left. So the tour is actually doing really well. So if you are interested in this tour, I highly recommend you go to our website, emergingwomenstreamwar.com and buy your tickets today because they are going pretty fast. So again, we're here to talk about James Monroe. Um, now I am born and raised here in Virginia. I actually grew up very close to one of Monroe's homes. So I know a lot about Monroe, but I know a lot of people do not. Uh, so Scott, I'm gonna ask you to give us a little bit of a background on Monroe's birth, his education, and kind of take us through childhood as much as you can <laughs> up, through his up through his college, college days. Sure. Well, good evening. Glad to be with y'all. Um, James Monroe's uh, family uh, came to uh, Virginia, came to the New World um, early in the uh, 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 mid, well, in the mid 17th century. His um, great great grandfather Andrew Monroe is who really starts to settle in the area of Westmoreland County that would be identified with the Monroe family um, forever after that. Um, he uh, uh, patented a lot of tracts of land. The Monroes were never really wealthy. They were comfortable. They were very um, uh, well established in the community. Uh, Spence Monroe, who was James Monroe's father, was a signer of the Leedstown Resolves. Um, and so he's there uh, uh, early in the revolutionary effort, uh, expressing the point of view of the community there. Um, and uh, taking a leading role in the community. So Monroe was born April 28, 1758, um, at the uh, family's uh, farm along Monroe Creek, not very many miles away from Pope's Creek, where George Washington was born uh, somewhat earlier. Uh, no real evidence that the Monroes and the Washingtons, you know, young James did not meet an older George Washington at that time because uh, the Washingtons had already moved away. But he uh, was well known within the community. He was able to go to a school um, that uh, Reverend Archibald Campbell operated for young men. Um, a, a classmate was J uh, John Marshall, um, who would go on to be a lifelong friend, although often a political adversary of Monroe's. Um, but they were both in attendance at that. And then um, in a fairly short space of time, by 1774, um, Monroe had lost his mother um, Elizabeth uh, Jones Monroe, who died um, uh, about a year or so before that, and then his father would die soon after he would go to the College of William and Mary. So Monroe is sort of starting off in life, going to William and Mary to go to school, already orphaned, relying on his uncle Joseph Jones, who was a noted jurist in Virginia, a judge later, uh, as sort of a, um, uh, not a, not a stepfather or, or, an, or an, uh, an adoptive father exactly, but as certainly a, a, a strong adult influence in his life. So Monroe comes to William and Mary right in time for all the revolutionary um, um, uh, pot overflowing um, uh, in Virginia and the rest of the uh, United of uh, the uh, American colonies, I should say. And so he's very impressionable. He's caught up very quickly in what's going on. 1775, he joins other students at William and Mary in uh, conducting uh, uh, not a panty raid, but a, a weapons raid on the governor's palace to secure arms um, for the uh, local militia. And then uh, by the following year, he is in the Continental Army in the 3rd Virginia uh, Infantry Regiment heading north, first under Hugh Mercer, then under George Whedon uh, to join Washington in the Continental Army. So very quickly, um, Monroe's involvement uh, in the Revolutionary War gets him right into the thick of things. And he will be with the Continental Army in battles at Harlem Heights, 
um, throughout the, the retreat across New York and New Jersey into Pennsylvania by the end of 1776, um, seeing uh, combat, seeing uh, the gradual wearing down of the Continental Army as the British are pushing him back. And that sort of sets up the situation that will come in December uh, as the Battle of Trenton is contemplated by Washington. And, and speaking of esteemed alumni from College of William and Mary, Mark Malloy, you are also from William and Mary, um, almost as esteemed as our uh, James Monroe uh, <laughs> topic tonight. You're um, in, this, in this era, yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right in this era, and we're gonna at some point we'll talk about the paintings uh, that one of them Mark has behind him that shows Monroe and some of the some of the historic licensing that was taken for that, or artistic licensing, I should say. So Mark, so Scott set us up about Monroe's background, um, you know, his, his interest in the military, obviously, his, his involvement down Williamsburg. Um, talk about a little bit about, you know, where is he in the minds of the continental leadership in 1776? Is he considered an officer? Is he an officer? What's his role? Is he well-respected? Take, talk a little bit about what people are thinking about James Monroe at the time of 1776. Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the things about, you know, and why I think Monroe is such an interesting figure, and I'm glad we're talking about him tonight, is because, and, you know, we'll go on later about, you know, he's going to have all sorts of accomplishments throughout his whole life, uh, but just how young he is uh, at this really important moment of the, of the war. Uh, so yeah, he's, he's 18 years, not even 18 years old when all of this is happening. And as Scott mentioned, you know, he's, he's at the College of William & Mary, which as Rob mentioned, I, I uh, attended uh, a, a few hundred years later, but, uh, <laughs> but it's a, it, it, it's a, and I'm glad the college had recently, actually a few years ago, just put up a, a statue of James Monroe down there, which is kind of neat. Um, and he is pretty, yeah, one of the more uh, well-known uh, alumni of, uh, of, of College of William and & Mary. And, uh, and as Scott was mentioning, you know, there was a lot of fervor for independence at that time. And it's actually interesting that uh, Monroe is going to leave the college to go join the 3rd Virginia, which was being raised out of the, the Northern Virginia area. Uh, some of his fellow classmates are going to stay down there, and they actually form a college company that's headed up by Bishop James Madison, who's James Madison, the famous James Madison's uh, a cousin, uh, who is the president of William & Mary. And they're gonna be down there and uh, actually gonna see a little bit of action later on in the war. Um, but while I was down there, we were actually able to create a, a reenactor group called the College Company of William & Mary, which is, it's great, it still exists. You got, you got everybody can look them up on Facebook. Uh, and uh, it's a student club to try and get people into reenacting and telling that early American history at college. But yeah, so James Monroe leaves, uh, and then yeah, he's going to be uh, uh, he's going to be yeah a, a, an officer by the time uh, you know, as Scott mentioned, that uh, the the American army is dissolving literally across New Jersey in the the winter of 1776. Uh, Monroe's going to be a lieutenant, um, and uh, he's a. Uh, yeah, uh, in, in the, the situation in December of 1776 is just so dire. And it's kind of amazing that young men who had, yeah, promising future like James Monroe uh, were really kind of uh, sticking with the cause here this late into the, um, into the game. And at what a point by December 1776, it was starting to look like it was all a lost cause. Washington's army had essentially evaporated from being over 20,000 men to uh, just three or 4,000 men he could count on the, the march. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, things were, were not looking good. And that's when the British are going to leave that Hessian garrison at Trenton. Uh, and they're going to call the winter campaign off. And they're going to be waiting for the spring that Washington is going to make, uh, I would say, one of the biggest gambles of the war. And that's uh, crossing the Delaware River on Christmas 1776 and marching and attacking Trenton. And a lot of people don't realize the, the, the famous people that were uh, a part of this, uh, this movement. And I, I think one of the, the most famous is James Monroe. So he is going to be there with Washington. He's going to cross the Delaware River. And uh, we mentioned paintings. If you look at the, the painting, the most famous image of, I would say, the whole revolution of Washington crossing the Delaware River, you can see James Monroe uh, right by Washington's side there. Um, uh, and it's all lies. 
<laughs> it's <Yeah>. all live. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, it, and it's interesting because Monroe's actually going to have a pretty important role because uh, the third Virginia, along with some of the other Virginia units, are going to go over uh, beforehand to actually kind of set up a, a screen to make sure uh, to secure the beachhead, so to speak, on the other mm -hmm. side of the river. Um, and I actually have the quote from him. If you'd like that, um, yeah, we'd love um, to hear let's it. do it. <laughs> he um, Monroe late in his life started his autobiography, although it was written in the third person, and he never finished it. He didn't get very far, really, but he did give us one of the only accounts of just what he was doing that night. Um, uh, and yeah, he's he's shown holding the flag behind George Washington and Lutz's or Lloyd's um, painting of Washington across the Delaware, but he's not there because, as he notes. The command of the vanguard consisting of 50 men was given to Captain William Washington of the 3rd Virginia Regiment. Lieutenant Monroe promptly offered his services to act as a subaltern under him, which was promptly accepted. And then here comes the longest run on sentence of any president in history. On the 25th of December, 1776, they passed the Delaware in front of the army in the dusk of the evening at McConkie's Ferry, 10 miles above Trenton and hastened to a point about one and one and a half miles from it at which the road by which they descended intersected that which led from Trenton to Princeton for the purpose and obedience of orders of cutting off all communication between them and from the country to Trenton. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so they, they go out and Monroe um, uh, notes that it was a, a, he called it a tempestuous night. Uh, it was literally a dark and stormy night, snow was falling. And along the, the, as the evening was going on, they're at a certain point of, on a farm of a um, local who comes out and he thinks they're British troops. He starts cussing him. Um, Monroe called him very, uh, determined in his manner and very profane. It was a local doctor named John Riker. And once he saw that they were Americans, it's like, oh, wow, this is great here, boys. Come in, have some food. And they said, well, no, we have to do this job. But he said, no, what? I'm going to go with you because something's going to happen tomorrow and I want to be there. Uh, in case it does, maybe I can help some poor fellow. And that's really prophetic for what's going to happen tomorrow, the next day, I should say. That's right. I, by the way, I just love that, yeah, he writes the autobiography in the third person. I, and and I, reading it is just very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not a page turner, I, I, I have to say. Um, he's, he's no Jefferson. Um, oh, that's but, fighting words there, Scott. Careful. Uh, I know. Well, I mean, you know, the man's not a writer, um, uh, uh, with the exception of the doctrine. He did a good job on that. But um, he did, though, uh, it, it, if you'll indulge me one more quote, <laughs> sure. because this one, again, from the autobiography, this actually gives you a much more vivid sense of what happened the next morning. Um, and of course, it, uh, as Mark knows better than, than any of us, Washington you know, was coming at this way behind schedule. Um, without about half or maybe two thirds of the force he thought he was going to bring, a um, couple of them freezing to death, I guess, on the way there. Um, and so it's already light when they're arriving. Um, there's already been a little totally unrelated attack, I think, on a Hessian outpost that that almost screwed the whole pooch for everybody. And Sullivan goes around, Washington goes in, they, they come in. And um, at some point, you know, since the Hessians aren't totally taken by surprise, and they're not all drunk or anything, they're actually starting to put together a, a, the, the beginnings of a defense and particularly with some cannon. And Monroe describes this, Captain Washington moved forward with the vanguard in front, attacked the enemy's picket, shot down the commanding officer and drove it before him. A general alarm then took place among the troops in town. The drums were beat to arms and two cannon were placed in the main street to bear on the head of our column as it entered. Captain Washington rushed forward, attacked and put the troops around the cannon to flight and took possession of them. Moving on afterwards, he received a severe wound and was taken from the field. The command then devolved upon Lieutenant Monroe who attacked in like manner at the head of the Corps and was shot down by a musket ball which passed through his breast and shoulder he was also carried from the field. And who was there to take care of him, save his life? John Riker, exactly. So perfect timing. I, I think that's really fascinating. One of the things that's interesting is, yeah, just, I mean, because the doctors out there that night when, they're, when they come around, I mean, there were a, few, a bunch of other people that were like traversing on the roads. 
that they kind of bring in because the fear was that one of these civilians would, you know, would be loyalists and they would get down and, and warn the Hessians of this attack. But I just think it's interesting because that night, as you mentioned, a dark and storm, I mean, you're talking snow, sleet, hail, like it was just an awful nor'easter that came through that night. It's just interesting how many people are out and about uh, at midnight. Um, yeah. And you're right. And the whole thing looked like it would have been over because they got there during daylight. But uh, I think the fighting down there that you just read, I think really shows the intensity of the combat. You talk about Captain William Washington, George Washington's distant cousin who gets shot down and then Monroe. I mean, I think getting shot, I don't, I don't know how many other presidents we've had that have actually, you know, been wounded like that in battle. Uh, it'd be interesting uh, <laughs> to think about. I think about. there's only one. I've been looking lately uh, because this question came up. I, I think the only other president or person who would become president was actually wounded in combat was John F. Kennedy. Ah. Um, when the destroyer cut his PT boat in half, right? Because mm -hmm. all the other presidents that served, I, McKinley wasn't wounded that I'm aware of. Um, Hayes. Uh, Someone, someone's yeah. saying Andrew Jackson, maybe. Andrew Jackson was not actually a soldier, and he was not right. in combat. He was he was kind of whipped up on by a British officer and did receive oh, a wound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, but I mean, I I that that's yeah. I mean that to me it's. That, that, that's possible. That's a possible. Certainly a wound sustained in combat. Monroe is the first. He's our first wounded warrior president, if I can borrow the term. Mm -hmm. um, but really, other than Kennedy, and, and, and I will give Jackson a, an asterisk there, um, uh, whether it's Truman, whether it's um, Eisenhower, Grant, any of them, they were in battle, sometimes in combat, maybe, but I don't think any of them were wounded. Um, so, but, but Monroe clearly is the first irrespective of whoever else did and the uh the musket ball is it is it lodged in his do they i, I is this stay inside him i think for the Stayed rest in of his body life. the rest of his life yes mm -hmm. and we've we've noticed in in the costume collection the clothing collection at james Monroe museum there are a number of waistcoats you know waistcoats vests that he wore um uh in his uh uh latter uh, 1780s period and going into the to the 1790s uh, stuff made in this country stuff made in France that there's been some alteration um, we we think for the the overuse of um, I always get this wrong he was shot in the left breast and so the the alteration appears that that his right arm was a little more overdeveloped because he had to use it more and there's there's a little huh. bit of a of a tailoring of the vest to kind of show one arm bigger than the other. Um, so uh, yeah, that did stay. And that was a physical reminder for him of his war service. But he, he noted throughout the rest of his career that the experience of being in the American Revolution, not just the war, but the entire movement of the revolution, the, the intellectual part, as well as the fighting part, um, was the basis for everything he would do in the rest of his career, um, because he felt that the ideals of representative government, of what the United States as an idea meant, were A, important enough to fight for, and B, important enough to spend his career trying to implement. Um, so this was a very transformative experience for him. And as Mark said, you know, before he's 18, by the time he's 19, he's a major, and he's writing furloughs for guys that... Um, at Valley Forge um, and would be before, I guess he's about 20, well, certainly before he's 21, he's a Colonel. Doesn't have a regiment, but he's a Colonel, you know, so it's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. And like I said, I think it's, uh, yeah, just uh, when you talk about, you know, I, I do think there's a lot of education and talk about the, yeah, the, the revolution, the ideals and like for him to, yeah, literally uh, put himself in the line of fire the way he had. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and Trenton is such an important action in reversing the entire, you know, view of the war because it was looking so negative. And after this battle, things start looking better for the Americans. Uh, it was a major turning point, uh, but the Americans were successful in surprising the Hessians. And uh, other than, you know, William Washington and James Monroe, they're pretty much and then a couple of people who, who died on the, the march there, there weren't any other major woundings or deaths in the, in the, in the battle. Right. 
So, uh, so they, they, they played a, a major factor in that and the real blood that was shed there on that pivotal day. And you can see that in the, the painting behind me, you can actually see uh, down here, uh, this is supposed to be Monroe uh, uh, being helped out there by Dr. Riker. And then this is uh, William Washington here uh, with the-, the bandage hands, hands, yeah. If anybody can find me, yeah, exactly. I've been trying to find out what, how, he, yeah, if he got shot through the hand or exactly what, uh, what, what, what wound William Washington specifically suffered there at Trenton would be. There, there was something, uh, I can't remember. I, Riker, I've only recently discovered Riker left some, some uh, accounts of things that I've not yet found, but I've, I've seen it referred to, oh, um, sure. that there might be a little more detail from him. Um, but yeah, they're, they're clearly, um, Trumbull is showing him with bandaged hands. Um, so it's something, and I believe on, is it on the white horse or on the chestnut one in the back? One of those guys is Whedon, is George Whedon. Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, actually, I think he's behind me. I think it's, yeah. uh, one of the guys behind Washington. I have to look at the key or whatever, but yeah, Whedon obviously factors major because he's yeah in command of these troops and has yeah deep roots right here uh, in, in Frederick, right. Virginia too. So, yeah, um, all these guys. Yeah, and that's one of the things you know. A lot of people ask why you know because I I've studied a lot of my study on Trenton and Princeton and these New Jersey battles, but you know Virginians were there at the van. Uh, not just at Trenton, but also at Princeton and also at the, the second battle. I mean, mm -hmm. they were kind of everywhere during the, this campaign and also the other battles. So it's just amazing that mm -hmm. at a time when there wasn't as much unity between the different colonies at that point, uh, uh, you know, here they were, you know, the Continental Army is really the embodiment of the American Union. And here are these Virginians fighting uh, against the British and Hessians up there in New Jersey. It's, uh, it's amazing. We'll count Hugh Mercer, even though he, he came over from Scotland. We, we'll count him as a Virginian. Oh, yeah. yeah, we'll claim him too. <laughs> so, um, Scott, you got a nice debate going on about presidents being wounded before being president. Rutherford B. Hayes is getting some votes. Oh, so, really? Okay. So add that to, yeah. your, to your research. I, I haven't looked that closely yet <laughs> to see, yeah. Um, um, Anyways, just kind um, of funny how people are debating different presidents yeah. who were wounded uh, but back to back to Monroe so obviously he knew that the after after the war and as he as he gets older he knew the importance of Trent did he other than his autobiography did he write anything else about it I mean did he I mean he had I mean, did he know how important that moment was in the in the, in the founding of the country he was part of well, I think he certainly could could see, of course, in the immediate aftermath, he's recovering. Uh, he's not there for Princeton, of course. Um, and really, um, he, he would it would be a while before he could be back in, in active service. He would be at Germantown. He would be at Monmouth. Uh, in fact, Monmouth's the last battle in which he um, is, is in the field um, uh, actually taking part. He's, he's reconnoitering and sending word to Washington about a possible attack that he helps forestall. Um, so, uh, he he sees what's going on, and I think I think Trenton is something that that comes up from time to time later in his career. Particularly 1817, 1819, he's touring the country. He's doing a northern tour uh, tour of the northern states in 1817, um, and then he's doing a similar uh, circuit through the southern states in 1819. And in these uh, tours, he encounters very often, almost every community, veterans of the revolution. And it's always very moving for him. Um, he usually, in public remarks of one sort or another at each of these stops, makes a reference to the sacrifices of the soldiers of the revolution. He claims, you know, the, the kinship with them. And then whether it's a newspaper account or whether it might be welcoming remarks, very often somebody makes a reference to Trenton. They'll talk about his glorious, you know, role there in wounding. Um, so I think there is an, a, an understanding of its importance. But for Monroe, you know, he's, he's applying it on an even bigger level, the importance of the entire revolution to the ideals of the country, to, to his uh, going into to public office. Um, and uh, I, I think that it was a much more commonly known fact of his role at Trenton in his time than it would be later. Um, I wouldn't say we had to totally rediscover Monroe's role at Trenton, but it's certainly um, 
uh, has had more attention paid in the last 20, 25 years. Um, I think that you can credit the James Monroe Museum with that. You can credit the papers of James Monroe as they've gone into the documentary record and updated it. Um, so uh, it, it, it's, it's definitely a major part of, of his legacy from the revolution. So, so Mark, what does he, once he recovers from his wounds, I think Scott mentioned a little bit about Monmouth. What, what's Monroe's service throughout the rest of the war? I mean, like uh, Scott said, yeah, he's going to rise through the ranks uh, and, and become colonel. Um, I think it's, you know, he is also going to be in with, you know, you have to imagine also, uh, you know, Washington's officer corps at that time, too, because he's going to become friends with Marquis de Lafayette uh, later in 1777. And uh, as Scott mentioned, he's going to be up in the uh, up at Valley Forge. He's going to serve with uh, John Marshall um, and all you, know, you kind of have this like, officer corps uh, of young men who are all going to be ending up playing uh, pretty sizable roles in the in the early Republic period. Alexander Hamilton and Burr, both. Burr, John Lawrence. Uh, I mean, you just have this like, I mean, I think that's one of the things about this about the revolution is so fascinating is the 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 amount of you know geniuses or whatever you want to you know the amount of these men who are all um came together were at the right place at the right time and uh monroe sure was 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 a part of that that group or whatever that and uh and serving alongside you know washington i think is gonna uh tie him to what as washington star rises you know kind of all these guys start you know they all kind of are there with yeah. him alongside him uh which leads to yeah ultimately uh you know we can get into it in a little bit about yeah washington and monroe's relationship with <laughs> the list on the list that, that, that needs uh, to be another program probably to, <laughs> to really do it justice. But, so uh, after so after the war scott what what are what's monroe's ambition what does he what do you think he sees himself as? Is it a leader in the state of Virginia? Or do you think he sees himself as possibly something on the federal national stage? We have a question here about, you know, did, was, was Monroe's ambition to be president like Washington when Washington became president? Did Monroe see himself in that way? Or what, give us a little background, what you think was going through Monroe's head when, that, when the war ended. Well, even before the war ended, you can get an idea of where Monroe's head is in terms of the choices he makes that uh, that that are based on the, the situation he's in he's presented with. He would have preferred, and he tried very hard to get a field command. He wanted a regiment, and he was authorized to form a regiment uh, of infantry, but he couldn't find the troops. Uh, by the time he's recovered, by the time he is uh, at a point where he's able to have a regiment. The, the men just aren't there to recruit and several efforts just fail. So he resolves that if he's not gonna be able to lead troops in the field, if there's no real prospect for advancement, um, he will leave the army and he will study law um, because he sees you know, the, the, the profession of lawyer as offering the best uh, future for him. Now he's got two choices. He can either go to George Wythe, who is the law professor of Thomas Jefferson, and he can become a really uh, accomplished lawyer, or he can go to Jefferson and study law with him and become a more accomplished politician. <laughs> and he chooses Jefferson because he determines politics are going to be the way for his public service role and for his advancement uh, to occur. And so he does, though, before the end of the war, uh, resume a military role as a military aide for Jefferson, who's governor of Virginia. And he's, he's authorized as a lieutenant colonel at that rank. And that, that's where he's trying to recruit is in the Virginia line to, um, to fill out that regiment. Um, he uh, goes down to the Carolinas. He, he's observing uh, the military situation there. He's actually at Yorktown, um, but not in a fighting capacity, more of an observer capacity. So he closes out the war, making that transition into politics. And it's very much at the state level initially. Uh, the entree to Jefferson, um, Jefferson taking him on as, as basically a mentor or, or as a protege, I should say. Um, uh, he meets Madison and they become part of this triumvirate with Jefferson, um, sort of the, the younger brothers uh, to Jefferson um, politically, uh, a lot of personal relationships. So he starts the climb. He starts the, the, 
almost like in the, in the classic Roman idea of the cursus honorum, you're, you're climbing the different offices toward the pinnacle of your career. He's on the governor's council of state, which is sort of a, uh, an appointed position that that's, would be kind of a forerunner to the state Senate in Virginia. Um, he will then be elected to the, the House of Delegates um, several times in his career. Um, and uh, as it's turning out, as the revolution is, is in the process of winding down, we haven't yet gotten to the Constitution yet, but under the Articles of Confederation, he goes to Congress. He goes to what is some call the Continental Congress still or the Congress of the Confederation. And Monroe is in the room uh, in December of 1783, 84, when, when Washington surrenders his commission. I cannot remember the date. It is a three. And there, there is a scene of Washington standing there in Congress and Monroe is like three people over, dressed very similarly to <laughs> buff waistcoat and pants and the dark jacket. And so he, he makes a very quick transition to from state to um, uh, federal uh, or, or national political office. And that will be, he will kind of go back and forth for the next 10, 15 years, because depending where he goes, um, you know, he's in New York, he's in Congress, he meets his wife, a future wife, Elizabeth Courtright. They marry, they come to Fredericksburg in 1786. He ends up on the Common Council of uh, Fredericksburg. He ends up in the House of Delegates again. He is in the Constitutional Ratifying Convention in Virginia. He didn't get to go to the one in Philadelphia, but he did the ratification. And then he's going, uh, he's going to be a senator. So he's going to be he's bouncing right back to the national level. And then that, from senator on, uh, largely, it's going to be a nationally focused career. Um, he is going to get diplomatic assignments by Washington first to go to France. Um, that's going to end badly in terms of the political break between Washington and Monroe. He'll come back, he'll be governor of Virginia for the first of three successive one-year terms, the way they did it then, um, going into the beginning of the 1800s. Uh, and then he'll be diplomatic uh, in another diplomatic assignment by um, Jefferson, sending him to help close the deal on what would become the Louisiana Purchase to attempt other negotiations with Britain and Spain. Um, he'll come back, he'll make a sort of a run for the presidential nomination in uh, 1808, but he'll, he'll lose to Madison. He'll be governor of Virginia again, then he'll be Madison's secretary of state, briefly secretary of war, and into the presidency. So that's a very broad brush <laughs> survey. I remember well, one, I remember once Scott telling me, and Scott, I fully 100% back you up, that he was the most prepared person to be, become president. Looking, looking at his resume, if you were to hire someone to be president based off of the resume, he would probably be near the top, uh, yeah. considering... The only area he is judicial, is the only one where he That's didn't a good really point, have but I mean, everything experience. else, I mean, he's a military veteran, he serves on all these different levels of cabinets and, and foreign emissaries, so he's, he's very much, very much a, a qualified individual. Um, so we're getting some comments here. Um, which I always try to encourage. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. That's what I'm doing here. I'm looking down here at the chat. Um, someone just brought up the Reynolds pamphlet and Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> Do you want to tackle that? <laughs> well, again, I'll try not to keep us here all night. This, this is tough. <laughs> I, I made the mistake of using this term once talking to the Washington Post and it stuck. Monroe's the Forrest Gump of presidents. Right. He seems to be everywhere in, in the course of his lifetime, all these critical moments. And you don't get this in Hamilton. When Monroe is in uh, a senator, he and a couple of congressmen receive a tip, basically, that, that Alexander Hamilton has been um, has become corrupt, the Secretary of Treasury, and that he's misappropriating funds. There's malfeasance. So they go to confront him with it. And they learn that, in fact, no, I'm paying blackmail to my wife's lover. Um, and at the time, Monroe and his congressmen say, oh, none of our business. OK, we'll take these documents you're giving us, proving that you're an up, uh, upright Secretary of Treasury. Uh, thanks. No problem. And we'll keep all this between ourselves. Um, and then a few years later, those documents end up being published. Monroe um, is accused by Hamilton of being the source of that. Monroe denies it. They come this close to a duel to the point of an angry confrontation where Hamilton calls Monroe a liar and Monroe jumps up and says, I'm ready, get your pistols. Um, 
they they are kind of separated from that. Aaron Burr actually plays a part in kind of diffusing the situation between them. Um, but uh, the whole Mariah Reynolds affair has James Monroe very much at the heart of it. And um, years, years, many years later, after Hamilton's dead and gone and may the rest of them, Monroe visits uh, Eliza Hamilton in an attempt to sort of patch things up and say, you know, there's so few of us left of the old days, we ought to try and you know, reach out and help each other. And she basically throws him out of the house saying, I want nothing to do with you. I've not forgotten what you did to my husband. And I don't care how much you want to, you know, think about good old times, you know, get out. So uh, it's a wound that, that stays, even though Monroe uh, protests his innocence. And, and it, it's, it's, it's not possible to really know. Right. But he was clearly at the heart of what the Mariah Reynolds affair would become, at least in, in, in terms of proximity to it. It sounds very Jeffersonian in the way uh, the gossip was released, right? Jefferson was known for yeah. working back channels stuff. So. I'm, I'm sure he had a knowledge of it. James Callender is the guy who publishes the, the correspondence. He would be you know, both hot and cold with Jefferson over the course mm -hmm. of his career, too. So um, well, it, it shows where the personal gets in with the political. Yeah, well, and I'm interested in the politics too, in the sense that because uh, it is going to be yeah major in in Washington and Monroe's relationship deteriorating. Uh, I, I find it interesting. Also, it sounds like yeah, with with Hamilton as well, uh, that a lot of the guys Washington and a lot of his officers all become very strong Federalists uh, in the years immediately after the war, and a lot of this is attributed to having fought in the war, having seen the dysfunction of the different states um, and things like that and, 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 and focusing on the need of that, you know, central authority to have power to be able to do things. Uh, so I find it really interesting that Monroe goes to Jefferson. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm a little interested, A, in if he's in the ratifying convention for the Constitution, what he thought of the Constitution, if he approved of it, and then also uh, 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 his politics in general, uh, do we know where any of that comes from? You know, is it become a strong anti-federalist and is it, um, and, and, and do we know what the source of that is? Is it because of Jefferson's influence and Virginia's influence on Monroe? Uh, because it seems like he goes different than many of his other fellow young officers in the continental. Yeah, I think that Monroe's uh, becoming a, a, a Democratic Republican, a Republican as they'd be known in that period, uh, it is strongly the, the Jefferson influence. It's his Southern roots. Um, it's also his uh, close identification with um, the, uh, the, the French influence on our revolution with Lafayette, with others, um, the recognition that we would not have gained uh, our independence without the French involvement. And so like other Republicans, they believe very strongly in that alliance. They believe that for the United States to uh, uh, achieve a closer relationship with Great Britain is going right against the ideals of what the revolution was supposed to be about. And so that, that's what undoes his first diplomatic mission. He's there, you know, he believes in good faith representing the United States attachment to the French alliance while the uh, uh, Washington administration has sent John Jay to negotiate treaty um, with Great Britain. Uh, without Monroe's real knowledge of what's going on. And I think that, that throughout his political career, even to the presidency, those Republican principles will be there, but they'll be tempered with the reality of the necessity of the, the British relationship and the necessity of a stronger federal government than most Republicans would have admitted to liking. Um, you know, Jefferson confronts this somewhat, Madison does, and Monroe too. Even though they're coming into office as Republicans, uh, and, and that states' rights predominance that they want to pursue um, domestically, they're understanding the need for some exercise of presidential or federal power. And they, they find reasons to excuse why they have to do that. But on the foreign policy side, it's very much a pro-French orientation. That's what, that's what drives their being Republicans in that time. So... Um... We have about 20 minutes left and we have forever to talk about Monroe. Maybe we'll have to do another one. But um, let's talk a little bit about, since we're kind of focusing on his early career um, 
I do want to talk about his presidency a little bit before we wrap up. Uh, we were talking before we went live about you know Monroe and Washington, and uh, Scott kind of alluded a little bit to some of the issues that Monroe would have mm-hmm. with with Washington and vice versa. Um, they were pretty close, and then uh, something happened, Scott. I know it's a long, intricate story, but uh, do your best. To you had a great exhibit at the, at the museum many years ago about this. I remember that, and um, it's it's very it's it's very intricate and it's very confusing. But see if you can clarify a little bit about what happens between George and James. Well, it just shows the degree of the intrigues going on as we're starting to evolve political parties, and and also weighing what's in the best national interest of the country. The Federalists. And again, this very broad brush. Federalists, especially expressed through Hamilton, believe that the best way of safeguarding the economic and even maybe the military diplomatic future of the United States was to have as close a relationship with Great Britain as possible. The Republicans, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, and others felt that there was both an honorable necessity to maintain the close French relationship, and there was a logical uh, kinship there, that as the French Revolution is underway, it is inspired by, it's a natural outgrowth of the American Revolution. They believe that these are sister republics that are changing the world, and that the whole idea of the revolution, the whole idea of where we're supposed to be going in in representative government says, don't have this closeness to Britain. So Monroe's very vocal, you know, uh, advocate of the Republican position as a senator. Washington appoints him to be an American minister to France, perhaps as much to get him out of the debate locally as it is to send him to France to represent the country. Whether he's being set up from the beginning, I don't know, but it it does become pretty evident that Monroe is um, not representing the government the way it wants to be represented, and so he's ultimately recalled as um, American minister. Now, that is humiliating to him he delays his return for a while, so it doesn't look like he immediately came back with his tail between his legs. And he writes a long pamphlet defending everything he did as American minister. It's called The Conduct of the Executive, and then there's a lot more after that. And he publishes this thing, distributes it. And it's a, it's, it's a real, not only a self-justification, it's a real screed against the Washington administration and, and what they're doing and predicting how bad it will be for the country. Washington gets a copy and in almost no other case does he do this, he fills it with margin notes where he's sort of refuting everything Monroe had to say. And, and it's very, very catty in a lot of ways. Um, and the upshot is that the two men become totally, totally estranged. They never really speak again. And even on his deathbed, when, Monroe, when uh, Washington is lying in Mount Vernon and he can't you know, speak or talk very much, and his aide is reading newspaper accounts to him, when they mention Monroe becoming governor, Washington gets really, really hyper about that. Uh, he responds with asperity, it's said. So even you know, uh, at the end of his life, he's still kind of damning James Monroe a little bit. And Monroe, for his part, I think kind of regrets that that estrangement took place, but he's, he's not, he didn't do anything in Washington's lifetime to, to try and change it. Um, but I think in many ways, his approach to his presidency both in terms of the symbols and the trappings and the policy, reflect some of the values that that Washington had in his, ironically, even though politically they were apart. I think that idea of being president, there were echoes of Washington's approach to the presidency in Monroe's. Yeah, it's just like a develop. It's just you can see these these two sides developing different views of what the revolution was and what the country should be, mm-hmm. and just kind of sometimes it gets personal, as you mentioned, <laughs> or catty. But yeah, um, I, you yeah know. I looked up that uh, exactly what uh, Scott was talking about, where Washington writes in the margins, and it's a, I think it's a good example of how some things change, but some things don't. It it, it reads almost like Twitter, where he says something. <laughs> And then Washington oh, yeah. has like a little like impossible like exclamation point or you know I mean it's just like <laughs> it's a uh, very interesting mm-hmm. to see uh, this like uh, deep yeah political divide that uh, uh, you see the sarcasm comes through yeah very clear yeah. from Washington 
Yeah. I, Mark and I argue quite a bit because because Mark is personally a huge fan of George Washington. I mean, I am too, but <laughs> George can do no wrong in Mark's eyes. And I think I think when Adams becomes president, George just kind of just I don't know. He's just he, he's a different person at that point in his career than he is in there at time. I mean, he's very personal. He's got a lot of vendettas on his mind. He's yeah, yeah. He's 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 he becomes a politician, which is you know something that I guess he always wanted to be, but much different in later years than he was you know early on we first got involved in politics the Um, only the only other duel that monroe almost fought ironically was with john adams or at least he thought about it and it was because of again what adams had to say about monroe coming back from this french mm -hmm. assignment and and basically adams wrote him off as just ruined you know because of his disgrace and for an exchange of letters with madison i think especially um, Monroe thinks, well, no, maybe I, I might need to challenge him to a duel, even as Adams is becoming president. He's thinking, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I can take this. He finally says, nah, I'm not going to do it. And then they reconcile later. But but he's even thinking of challenging the sitting president to a duel, at least entertaining the thought over the right. slight of his reputation. Yeah. Right. Just imagine if they had social media back then, what the outcome of that would have been. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So really quick, how does Marshall and Monroe maintain their friendship with their deep political divide? Because, you know, I mean, we talk about Washington and, and Monroe having their separate. And then, of course, it's much different than Marshall and Monroe. But how, is, how do Marshall and Monroe stay close? I mean, how are they able to bridge that divide um, throughout their life? I, I, I don't know if I would say close as, as much as maybe cordial. respect. Um, yeah. Yeah, there was a respect. Yeah, they they. Um, the, the arcs of their careers didn't bring them into direct confrontation with each other very much. And so that was one thing. They, they, never, they never ran against each other for office. They didn't have, I think, um, issues that really put them so much on the opposite side of the outcome that they were personally invested in one beating the other or anything like that. Um, Marshall's career obviously focused more ultimately on the judicial, although he did have the diplomatic um, side to uh, his own Secretary of State and, and, and uh, amb- ambassadorial experience, but I, I I think at least in part their their childhood acquaintance that they had known each other personally from uh, long before. I think Marshall on the whole was a a fairly um, personable individual, and and I think that he and Monroe were able to focus on the positives and the things they had in common more than the things they had. Uh, um, uh, uh, the, more the differences that they had. Um, but I, I, I've not gone into that much of the relationship to know if there's anything more than to simply they, they, they thought well enough of each other to maintain a, a cordiality, even when they had political differences. It wasn't to the knife between them, like it turned out to be with some others. But even Monroe, for the most part, did not have those sort of really vicious relationships with other politicians. Um, um, he, he generally had a more even-handed approach with them, even if he was very partisan, but it didn't get personal that often. Right. So when you look at Monroe's career, I'm gonna ask you a very hard question and they're gonna be like, well, I'm not sure how to answer that, but it's not detailed history, but you know, we haven't jumped into his presidency, um, but when you look at Monroe's contributions to the country and the founding of the country, you know, you have the era of good feelings, which you haven't talked about. We had the Monroe Doctrine, which we haven't really talked about. Um, mm-hmm. And then you have everything he does, you know, in, in, in state and federal service. What would you think, Scott? And I'll get to you too, Mark. What do you think is Monroe's biggest contribution to, to this country? Monroe's biggest contribution is he is, he is trying to apply the ideals of the, of the revolution that he fought for to the notion of this country emerging as a representative democracy that could be a, a symbol and a, a, uh, an example for the rest of the world. I mean, he truly believed that. Now, he did not believe that it applied to people of color. He did not believe that it applied to Native American populations. And, and he, he understood the conflict that those represented. And he never really resolved that, but he still felt that the best hope of the world was the United States succeeding. Um, and his diplomatic approach as expressed in what would be called the Monroe Doctrine was that we needed to 
keep developing this experiment in this hemisphere without either European influence here or us get involved in what's going on in Europe. And there's the echo of Washington. It's right. like in his farewell address, stay the hell out of what's going on in Europe. Uh, it'll just drag us under. So I think Monroe is very much a symbol of the United States at least attempting to form a government that reflects the ideals of its, of its revolutionary beginning and to try and put that not only out there for its own existence, but for the world's existence. Um, and, and so that's, that's what he is attempting to do. But even before his term is over, you, you see the Missouri Compromise, you see the early indications that slavery and, and the fate of that is going to change the political dynamic uh, in, a, in a way that goes in a whole other direction. Right, right. Uh, Mark, what do you think? <laughs> don't say Trent. Don't, don't say Trent. <laughs> well, no, that's what I was gonna say. Is Sorry. is you can all, all these? I, I think yeah, Monroe Doctrine. I think uh, Monroe's influence in the early Republic period is huge. He's also like a, a you know what they call him the last of the cock hats. Like he's the mm. he's a living link to that early Revolution generation as we become as we go into the the. Uh, the 19th century and eventually yeah, into the Civil War era. So, so he's kind of this 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 uh, extremely influential and important figure. But yes, that is just a couple inches away from all going away at Trent. Um, and uh, right. if Dr. Riker wasn't there, yeah, it's all over there at Trent. There is none of that influence. Um, and the site that's there today uh, is just a city street in Trenton. It's not marked. It's not uh, interpreted in any way. But if you want to come see it, you anybody can buy a ticket and come uh, just a couple <laughs> months. We're going November 12th to 14th. We're going to be in Trenton. Uh, and one of the highlights of the tour is going to be pointing out uh, the, the location of exactly where Monroe is actually wounded um, and talking about uh, his significance in this country. And some of that, yeah, obviously stemmed from his Revolutionary War service. But right, I think Mark, it's also I, I think we should talk. You know, I know we got three minutes left here, whatever. But I want to. Well, talk we started late because I couldn't. I couldn't work the computer tonight, so right, we can yeah. go. We can we go a few go, minutes late. <laughs> but I, I want to talk about yeah historic sites. Uh, associated yeah, well, I was, yes, with yes. So I don't know if I'm jumping the gun here, Rob. But well, uh, I was going to let Scott lead off because Scott, you know, works and runs one of the. The best museums that tells the story of James Monroe. So, um, Scott, well, wherever a little bit you about want me to do it, I'll plug the book and and the, the <laughs> talk about it. So, we'll we'll do the book last. We'll, we'll do like things people can read about Monroe because um, we like to leave our our watchers and listeners things to read during the week. But Scott, a little bit about your museum and uh, how it got started. I mean, you know, I I've, I live close by, so I know a little bit about it. But tell tell our, our viewers about your museum, how it got started, the the myth of the law office, and 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 what you all uh, interpret today. Okay, um, again, <laughs> I'll try to condense here. Um, and, and I should say, our other museum, Gary Meltzer's Home and Studio, is wonderful. It has nothing to do with James Monroe or the Revolutionary War. Um, James Monroe Museum is located in downtown Fredericksburg, Charles Street, at the site that's traditionally understood to be his law office. Um, Monroe was there from 1786 to 89. He lived elsewhere in town in his Uncle Joseph Jones' house. But by tradition, his law office was at that site. Now, um, we don't know, really, if he had a law office per se there. He did own the property. Um, we do know, though, in 1927, his descendants, his great great granddaughter uh, and great great grandson um, purchased the property um, in order to save it from being uh, demolished, the buildings there from being demolished. They are all buildings that post date Monroe's ownership of the property, but they were still very old. They opened the family museum there. That museum was later given to the Commonwealth and has been under UMW and all of its different identities since 1964. And so it's a, a state museum run by the University of Mary Washington and with a collection, the largest collection of artifacts and archives anywhere related to James and Mary. It's a fan, and, it's, and it, we'll put in the chat later the website, Scott, so people can find more information about it who aren't, yeah. who aren't local, um, but it's a fantastic museum. How about some other places people can go learn about Monroe? Uh, historic Sites Museum, Scott, Mark, places that you all would recommend people to go visit. 
Uh, Mark? Oh, well, I'll jump in and well, I already gave the plug for Trent, so you can go see where yeah. he was wounded. Um, uh, I, and I also mentioned the statue that's at uh, his uh, alma mater, William and Mary. Uh, I think one of the coolest places to go visit related to Monroe is his uh, grave, uh, which is in Richmond, Richmond at Hollywood Cemetery. A lot right. of people forget that, yeah, Monroe is another president who died on July 4th, uh, which uh, everybody remembers the Jefferson and Adams thing, but, you know, Monroe was uh, shortly thereafter um, on another July 4th. And then how his uh, body is moved, he died in New York, and uh, how his body is moved down to Virginia right on the eve of the American Civil War. And it was really, I think, interesting to read about that movement of his body. And it was kind of trying to bring back this nationalist feeling of North and South being together. And uh, and his grave is kind of cool because it's in, it looked, I think they call it the bird cage because it looks like it's in a, in, in a bird cage with iron around it. Um, but it's kind of cool to be in Richmond, Virginia and be able to find the, uh, the grave of a veteran of the Battle of Trenton. So... We just, um, uh, the James Monroe Museum's e-newsletter, it's a three-part story on Monroe's um, funerals in New York and the two burials in New York that he had, and then the effort to bring him from New York to Virginia in 1858. Henry Wise, as governor, does that, as Mark says, for this, both a way of showing Virginia's ties to the revolution, but it's also a way of showing Virginia's leadership of the South as the sectional crisis over slavery is coming along. And then the third story was about the, the tomb itself, which uh, was called the birdcage for so long, kind of still is, but it's been thoroughly restored. And it looks like it did originally, and it's more like a cathedral than a, a birdcage, uh, just gloriously uh, restored. Um, I would also note James Monroe's Highland, his home in Albemarle County, that's uh, under William and Mary, um, our sister institution, if you will, that, that looks at the, the Monroe experience in that um, farming uh, environment, um, reinterpreting the site from what it was once known to be. They've, they've discovered the uh, remains of the original house, and they've engaged the Descendants Council of um, formerly enslaved people at uh, Highland, the descendants of those people, to be able to tell a, a, a really good evolving story about the experiences of the enslaved population there at Highland. And so they do wonderful work. The um, state capital for that matter. Um, you, can, you can get a lot on the tour there about Monroe's role in state government as well, and the governor's mansion, which he signed the uh, bill to create. Although right. never did. So books, let's talk about things to read. Uh, I, I showed a book earlier and Scott said it was old and outdated, so I won't show it, Scott. But <laughs> well, Harry, yeah, Harry Ammon's um, uh, James Monroe, The Quest for National Identity was the standard one volume book from the uh, I guess the late 70s when it was written to, yeah. to, you know, up until very recently. But an author named Tim McGrath, who has previously written on naval topics, but also working now on a um, biography related to um, George uh, Mead, um, has, has tackled Monroe in the newest one volume biography, James Monroe, A Life, published last year. Um, it's not a uh, tiny book. Um, and this is like, only one third of the manuscript that, that Tim McGrath had created when he wanted to do this. So wow. it, it's a wonderful one volume book that, that takes a lot of advantage of, of more recent scholarship on Monroe. And on um, November 4th, uh, Monday coming up in the first Monday of November uh, at 7 p.m., the James Monroe um, Museum will be having its annual Monroe lecture virtually as all the programs are, and it'll be a conversation with Tim McGrath. Uh, that will oh, be a awesome. Facebook Live event. And um, he will talk both about Monroe uh, and various parts of his career, his family, but also the process of researching and writing a book like this. So if you're interested in history, it's great. If you're interested in politics and government, or if you're interested in how to write a big history book, you'll get a little something about that too. I, well, I will uh, the, the papers of James Monroe as well, the project at Mary Washington that for the last um, more than 20 years has been working on publishing his official and, and, and personal correspondence in volume eight right now, uh, preparing that of a 10 volume series. And that's done a lot to, to inform uh, the, the documentary record about Monroe. Um, that's going online. We hope by the end of this year, digital editions have gone through Rotunda a um, little late, but we're finally getting it there. So have an opportunity to see that um, 
uh, online here uh, in the near future. That's great. And we'll, um, Scott, we'll, we'll share that event to our Facebook page from okay, the museum great. to kind of advertise that. Um, so we're going to wrap up. Is there anything else, Mark, you want to say about James Monroe uh, that we haven't already said? I mean, there's tons we can say about his presidency. Didn't even get to it. That's okay. Um, but is there anything you want to leave us with? No, I think this is great. I think this makes me, yeah, want to learn more about Monroe. I'll have to check out that McGrath's book. Uh, I would say the, uh, the other thing I was going to say, I mean, it's more of a Washington focus, but we, we interviewed Peter Henrikus uh, a, a few months ago in his book, First and Always, about George Washington. That has a good article uh, or a good chapter about all of Washington's Virginia fellows who, yeah, he kind of breaks away with and it includes mm -hmm. James Monroe. Uh, that again, yeah, as we mentioned earlier about Washington, even on his deathbed being upset about it. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's such a sad story because, you know, you see how at Trenton, you know, these two lives are linked forever, really, in this, uh, this event. Uh, but then how politics and other things kind of, uh, kind of change all of that. Um, oh, there you go. Lynn yep, Cheney's right. book on the Virginia dynasty. Want to make sure I mention that too, because again, all these people we've talked about intersect in in uh, this very good readable. Yeah, yeah I, think, uh, I think all of these kind of show that. Yeah, we usually think of, or people usually say, founding fathers as a monolith, uh, but it was really they all had. You know, even though they all had in in their own respect uh, what they thought was the best interest of the country at heart, they had very different ideas on how to go about that. And, yeah. Led to many, uh, many divisions, many conflicts, and yeah, uh, sadly, uh, breaking of friendships and stuff like that. So, yeah. and we'll put that. links to those books. People are asking about the different books. We'll put links to the books that Scott um, and Mark have mentioned in the chat when we're done. Um, but thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mark, as always. Mark and I spent today together with our kids. So good to see you again, Mark. Uh, <laughs> and, and Scott, thank you for joining us. People don't know, but Scott has been a mentor to me in the Virginia Museum field. He is, we call him the godfather of Virginia <laughs> museums here in Virginia. And, and it's always an honor to have Scott on. And Scott is a, a, a great speaker. And he's spoke for me before at work about Monroe. And uh, thank you, Scott, for for sharing all the information you have about Monroe and all the work you're doing there in Fredericksburg. I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, Pleasure. Enjoyed it. So uh, as, as Mark said, we have our bus tour coming up in November. He's mentioned it several times. He will take you to the exact spot that, that Monroe was shot. You know, right, Mark? Exact spot um, on that tour. Uh, but in two weeks, Mark, who do we have with us? I mean, what are we doing in two weeks on our next Sunday night chat? To be determined. Uh, Battle we'll of Princeton, though. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. we'll be talking about the Battle of Princeton, um, but just yeah, keep an eye out. We'll we'll post a event notice for that, and also in uh, in another couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about another Trenton Princeton uh, part, the Battle of uh, Ironworks Hill, uh, which is little known uh, and kind of shows you that there was a lot of stuff going on in the ten crucial days uh, outside of the ten crucial days. It wasn't just Trenton and Princeton. There was a lot of activity, so we're gonna we're gonna explore some of that with our friend Adam Zielinski. Uh, That's so, right, Adam. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you everyone for watching. Join us in two more weeks. We'll be back here on our ERW Rev War Revelry. And thank you again, Scott. Thank you, Mark. Everyone have a safe two weeks. We'll see everyone soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.